Okay, so uh, hi everyone, I'm Jokia, and thank you very much for the uh, welcome and the introduction and for inviting me here. So it's a pleasure to uh, visit you. Um, so basically today I'll speak a bit about my PhD work and how that how that led to the work that I'm doing now. Um, and uh, yeah, basically I'm now based at the London School of Economics, and uh, I wanted to also just add to the intro that my background is in psychology. And so that's important because right now I'm in a, in a center that's full of health economy. So it's a very interesting new environment um, to learn from. Yeah, so basically um, today I'll touch on, on various questions about including cross-cultural differences in mental health service development. Overall, this is a question that I'm very interested in in my career. And yeah, basically I, this is just my journey in pictures. I started off in Hungary. Um, and then I went to live in Latvia for uh, for a year, and then after that I moved to the UK. And then in my PhD, I lived in Ethiopia and in Argentina for a while. So that was, I think, the most important impact on my work leading up to now. And then after that, I worked with Origin. I'll tell you a bit more about that, and that led to uh, now being at the LSC. Um, so first, I'll tell you a bit about my PhD. I did that between 2018 and I had my viva in 2022. Um, and basically, in my PhD, I was interested in how we can develop services for caregivers who raise children with developmental disabilities, uh, including autism and intellectual disability. And I was particularly interested in how we can empower caregivers so that they can support their children in different income settings and different cultural contexts. Um, and so that was based in a rights-based uh, perspective and rights-based approach to service development. The reason why I have been interested in autism in particular within developmental disabilities uh, is because during my psychology training so in Hungary, it's a very clinically focused training program in psychology. And so I did my placement in child and adolescent psychology from the very beginning. And I worked there a lot with autism. So that's where the interest came from, from the beginning. And then later in my master's, I already worked with autism, in particular the female experiences with autism in the UK, in England and Scotland. So in my PhD, the background that I focused my work on was on the socioeconomic determinants of accessing um, services for families who are impacted or who have a child with uh, developmental disabilities. We know that there's a lot of stigma around uh, mental health and also specifically developmental disabilities globally, also in high income contexts. And then this is especially relevant for contexts where services are often unavailable or not accessible at all for stigma, exclusion, or just because the services are so far away that you cannot uh, practically go and, and receive those services. And we also know that caregivers and the families who are impacted and who are raising um, a child with autism, for example, um, they often go through experiences of distress for uh, various reasons, partially because of the stigma and the exclusion they may experience. Um, and that can lead to mental health challenges um, later. So in my PhD, I looked at power theories and empowerment theories from uh, social sciences to look at what that looks like when we have a family with a child with a developmental disability and we want to improve the services for them and we want to um, empower the caregiver himself or herself. And so the working definition that I use for this empowerment journey is that it's a social process for individuals as well as communities to increase their level of control, agency, and decision-making capacity um, in the ways they wish to. Practically, what that means is that um, in many countries, and in my own country as well, in Hungary, when um, in, when there's a caregiver with a, with a child who receives an autism diagnosis, that often means that that caregiver is then reliant on having services and having professionals who deliver those services to them. And so the idea is how can we use caregiver interventions so that caregivers can learn some of those skills and they can deliver some of those uh, practices at home. It doesn't imply that that's only what they should receive. No, it should go hand in hand with specialist services as well, but how can we make some of that happen? Um, so yes, I was basically working on how we can use these caregiver mediated interventions to empower families in different socioeconomic settings and different public health systems. Um, and so basically, this is the outline of the work that I did. I did three key studies. And the first one was a more global, more international work um, with participants 
who all received the World Health Organization's Caregiver Skills Training. It's a training that will form part of the, the Mental Health Gap Action Program, one that you might be familiar with in terms of scaling up mental health services worldwide. Um, and so there we work with caregivers and with professionals from, from that context. Uh, and we looked at the, the contextual and cultural adaptations of uh, caregiver interventions for these families. And then I did a multiple case study design. So that's when I worked in Ethiopia and then in Argentina um, to look at, so this was a comparative analysis of how, um, what caregiver empowerment means locally, how caregiver interventions can work locally and uh, what the contextual differences mean in terms of the adaptation of the work. Um, so I wanted to tell you all of this so that you understand the background that I come from. As you can see, this is not specifically youth mental health. This is focusing on children and their caregivers. Um, but basically there was, um, and basically that what the way that was wrapped up was that when I finished the PhD, I got some more funding from the Medical Research Council to do some follow-up work and dissemination activities, particularly in Argentina, so in one of the cases that I worked with. Um, and so basically how I then ended up in youth mental health was that I did my PhD during the time of COVID-19. So that had like a major impact on the work that I was doing. When our first lockdown started, I was in Ethiopia in the middle of data collection. So as you can imagine, a lot of that work all of a sudden became impossible because it was unsafe uh, for everyone involved to keep meeting the families, to keep traveling and, and um and get other caregivers from different remote communities to, to come together. Um, and so basically, the and I came back to London from Ethiopia, and then on the advice from uh, King's College London, I left the country and then went back to Hungary. So basically, massive shift in the middle of what I was then doing. Um, and I went back to the university where I had initially studied, and we started a crisis mental health center there with the colleagues, with the psychologist colleagues that I knew from there uh, for young adults. Um, who were either studying or who were recent graduates of the university in Budapest, Budapest in the capital and then also in the, in, in the countryside. And, um, and basically this was a reaction to what was happening then in March 2020. Um, and it started off as an initiative really to tackle the, the very quick mental health impact of the pandemic. Uh, and it didn't start with the intention that we would then build on some research on it. So it was really reactive to what was happening in the world. Um, and so this was an online brief mental health crisis intervention for young adults. Um, and it was um, clinical psychologists and counseling psychologists delivering the program. Um, and because it was focusing on a very particular issue, COVID-19 impacting our world, um, the counseling process had some um, very unique uh, features, which included that uh, all the counseling was problem oriented and taking a cognitive approach. So it was three to six sessions maximum. Um, and then that some of the activities included were mood tracking, motivation tracking, uh, and then some carriers looking for those who were about to finish their studies and were not sure how to continue. And then in the last session, it was looking into the future, what was coming for them and how they can maintain these skills. And then some of the key difficulties. So basically what we did was that as the first wave of, wave of the pandemic eased, we came together with uh, this group of psychologists and we said, okay, it would actually make sense to reflect on what we have seen, what were some of the key challenges, and then write it up in a paper that's more just observing what happened and then build on the experiences in some research paper. And so the paper that resulted from this work, uh, in that we summarized that, of course, some of the key challenges reported included um, well, difficulties in daily functioning, so changes in sleeping patterns and eating patterns, uh, difficulties to adjust to everyday life because of the quarantine and because of um, the daily routine that all of a sudden changed or was non-existent. Um, and then, of course, many people experience stress, fear, anxiety because of the uncertainty that um, these people and I guess all of us experienced. And we also noted that when a person came in with a pre-existing mental health condition, then very often those symptoms or those experiences were further triggered by the experience of the care and the pandemic. Um, and what we also found um, very interesting in this particular context was that the counselors themselves went through similar issues. So it meant that while otherwise the counselor and the person receiving counseling would be would have that necessary distancing between them. Some of that experience was shared. 
Um, and so that may be just quite a unique um, thing to do. And basically, in, 20, in the summer of 2020, he read that this work and then it continued as a social enterprise locally. And, um, and then basically locally, a couple of other things happened then, um, which was we wanted to end this counseling program. And then it was basically when the war on Ukraine started. And so in Hungary, uh, just to give you some context, in the, in the west of Ukraine, there's an important Hungarian speaking population. And so the students um, in Hungary, a lot of them either have family there or come from there themselves. And so it meant that on the one hand, we were receiving many refugees arriving from Ukraine. And on the other hand, we had um, Hungarian speaking students and Hungarian speaking staff members who had families coming in. And then that meant another wave of, again, some crisis happening and then we continue the program basically. Um, and so this work overlapped with me working with Origin. Um, I will tell you a bit about that work because the combination of these two pieces led to the work that I'm now doing at the LSC. Um, so as mentioned, Origin is, they are a non for profit um, organization in Australia. Their work is mostly in Australia, but they do some projects with their global team uh, elsewhere around the world. So where I came into play was with projects that are based in Europe or have some European context. And so based on the work that we did in Hungary during COVID and, um, and the war in Ukraine, that's why my work became relevant for a piece of work in Serbia that I'll, I'll tell you about now. Um, so in this work, and this was 2022 already, so leading up to um, or recently. Um, it, so UNICEF, uh, UNICEF Serbia wanted that in Central and Eastern Europe, we started thinking more about youth mental health and um, mental health service development for, for a younger generation and focusing particularly on adolescents and then the 18 to 25 range uh, where people sometimes fall in between um, youth services and adult services. And then basically my role in this project was to overlook uh, the service development work that we did and produce some research and produce some materials. So the goal was to um, work out a minimum services package for youth mental health in Serbia. This, this was a very technical term, a minimum service package. What does that mean? It means what are the minimally what are the services that must be there for all young people in a country like Serbia so that all needs um, that we can expect that with, with the rise in youth mental health would be met? Um, so this was the project that we did with Origin. And so you can just see the process here. Um, we initially did a, a piece of needs assessment. We worked with young people and professionals from uh, three parts of the country to look at um, what's available now, what are the needs? Uh, what are the what are the gaps in services available? And then we did three pilot programs in these three municipalities in Serbia um, with professionals who, who were non-specialists who, who worked with supporting young people, but not in a mental health capacity. So they were either teachers, uh, psychologists, but working in schools, um, or social workers, or psychologists in social welfare, welfare overall. And most of them had not received clinical training before. Um, and so in this pilot, what we wanted to see was how can we train non-specialist health, uh, health and social care workers so that they can deliver some uh, minimal, minimally viable services to young people. And the interventions included in this program um, were things like training on early warning signs, um, self-care, lifestyle interventions, um, and then for the younger age group, how to interact with family members, who they be involved in the process. And then basically after the pilots, we did a capacity building training for a larger number of professionals, 150 people. And, uh, and then they did 10 cases, um, 10 young, they took 10 cases of young people with different mental health related concerns and needs um, from across non specialty settings. And that's where we went up the program. Um, and so basically in the, old, the final product, which is this minimum services package, uh, we outlined some of the core principles of um, youth mental health and youth involvement in service development. We speak about these key interventions, 
um, and that we give some guidance on how to build integrated care uh, in the country, what are some of the referral pathways that can work for professionals, and then we uh, put together an initial scaling plan, but this is now up to yourself to actually take that on board. And so the core principles are, I, I guess they are not surprising from um, for people who are in their everyday work involved, are involved in youth mental health, but so yes, firstly, youth engagement and participation throughout uh, service delivery, um, making sure that there's collaboration across different professional groups. Uh, in Serbia, we saw that the social welfare and health sectors just basically did not work together at all. So we were trying to make those connections in between them. Um, and that all practices and services are centered around the young people, but meanwhile are evidence-based. So we make sure that um, they work. And so, as I said, this is just another list of the key interventions that we included in this program. Um, and then the referral pathways. So this, this illustration was put together by the Institute of Mental Health in Serbia. They were the ones who were uh, scanning or monitoring what relationships exist already across sectors and then they basically build this. Uh, it does look complicated. What it basically says is that a lot of those sectors did not work together. And now through the training, at least there are some initial relationships in the, between them. And uh, scaling it up will mean maintaining or building some stronger referral pathways um, across these different sectors. So we wrapped up this program in the summer of the last year, so 2023. And um, some of the interesting reflections after this piece of work included that um, when it comes to youth involvement in Central and Eastern Europe, um, before we can effectively involve young people when developing services, we first need to speak about the power relations in between professionals. So especially the older generation of professionals, they often come with a mindset that um, that they have been through many years of training, they have a lot of years of experience, and so opening up and giving that decision-making capacity to young people who are just young people and may not yet have a degree, but probably they do, uh, is very hard. So basically, this was a this was a very important challenge for us in this piece of work, uh, and so this meant that youth involvement throughout the project was very challenging. Uh, we could consult them, but to meaningfully involve them in the design process of these materials, it was it was very hard. Um, and so this leads up to the fellowship that I'm doing right now at the LSE, uh, which I started officially in October, so uh, a few months ago. Uh, but basically, I wanted to build on, I walked you through the PhD that I did with some cross-cultural perspectives on caregivers. And then from there, the, the important experience of um, building up this counseling service in, in Hungary, in COVID, and then the war on, on Ukraine, and then experience uh, with origin uh, and youth mental health and the challenges in my region of the world in terms of youth involvement. So basically what I'm doing now is, on the one hand, this ESRC fellowship allows me to finish writing up papers from my PhD, which is excellent, and then I'm designing a piece of new research project um, on young adult mental health. Um, and I'm uh, I, I'm meanwhile applying for funding and I'm doing some dissemination activities. So those of you who are doing PhDs and are finishing up, uh, I recommend checking out this ESRC fellowship because it gives you the opportunity to to do a bit of wrapping up, but meanwhile doing new research and plan for the future. Um, and so based on all this previous work that I mentioned, now what I'm doing is I'm interested in how macroeconomic changes and shocks may or may not impact young adults' and mental health and well-being. I'm especially interested in um, coping skills and resilience. Um, and so my working definition of psychological resilience for this piece of work is that um, individuals do not or just only temporarily become ill or unwell despite a, an exposure to um, psychological or physical adversity. I say this is a working definition because if when I look at the youth resilience literature, it's immense and people we'll talk about it in different ways. Um, this is where I am now. It is potentially changing in the future based on discussions with others. But this is where I am now in terms of what I mean by uh, resilience. Um, and so I'm working on a couple of core things right now. I'm mapping firstly and initially young adults' experiences with macroeconomic shocks. And I right now focus on young adults who live in Hungary, 
and Hungarian young adults who live in the UK. So I want to keep the comparative nature in the work. Uh, the reason why I focus on hun Hungarians first is because I am Hungarian, so of course I relate to it very well. Um, and then because in the region there are many different local languages that people speak. Uh, so I want to make sure that when I onboard new collaborators in this piece of work, I want to make sure that they that we all have the capacity and and uh, the time, the financial capacity, and 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 the commitment to this project, so that um, more collaborators could be onboarded. And when I say young adults based in Hungary, so that means either Hungarian nationals, or it means, for example, those Ukrainian national refugees who are now actually based. Um, in the country or young people of any nationality who live in Hungary currently. And so as part of this, I'm also looking at the existing support uh, systems for young adults. Um, and so that means looking at the formal and informal initiatives supporting young adult mental health. The reason why it's important is because a lot of the um, a lot of the services that are available would not you would not find them in peer reviewed literature. Uh, so it's a big challenge. You will see in the methodology that I'm trying to uh, tackle that, um, and especially not in a English speaking future. Um, and I'm also interested in differences in needs based on educational background and experience and um, like mental health history in young people's past. And I'm building a board of advisors. Uh, actually, by now I have them, so that's, that has been a nice achievement. The theoretical background or some of the literature that informs my work is that I'm looking at mental health through a transdiagnostic model um, and the dual continuum of mental health. Um, I'm looking at the youth mental health and resilience literature as well. And then um, most recently on uh, advice from some of the colleagues at the LSE, um, they advised me to look at the hierarchy of barriers, which for me was a new concept, but uh, basically, just means that accessing services and support um, can have a range of barriers, and some of those barriers can come hierarchy, um, which is a helpful concept. Um, and I wanted to show you this illustration just to say that um, when we think about services that can be provided across the mental health spectrum, um, I'm interested in the prevention and mental health promotion side of things. And even within prevention is the primary prevention um, that's in my scope for this uh, piece of work. And so what I'm currently working on is a rapid review of literature, um, a crowdsourcing survey among professionals supporting young adults. And I'm doing uh, mostly qualitative interviews with young adults. And I'll just say a few more, more words about that in a moment. The key collaborators, these are two universities from Hungary and then civil society organizations that are either based in Hungary or in the UK. And this has been a very interesting, this has been taking a lot of time to uh, build up those collaborations, but I'm very excited about it because, for example, Partners Foundation and Roma Versidas are two NGOs in Hungary that um, gather young people who are either from a Roma background in uh, very remote villages in the country or who come from very challenging socioeconomic settings or sometimes abusive families in, in their past. And so that's, I'm, I'm hopeful that this will help us have a more representative, representative sample across the study and not just the university students from middle to high class. Um, yeah. In terms of the interview, so I've I've been starting with them uh, this month. I'm conducting them. I mean, 99% of them will be in Hungarian, but I also offer interviews in English uh, in case if there are young adults who um, come from other countries and they live in Hungary. Um, we are recording them and transcribing them. The exciting thing is that they are now there is now software available that can do it even in Hungarian language and it's uh, GDPR compliant. Uh, so that's exciting. And the participant subgroups that we are looking at are either current students, early graduates, and then those who have not received formal higher education, but may have been uh, in further education, but that's not a criteria. And so some within with the interviews, we are also looking at some of the uh, mental health related uh, outcome measures for now, just to check whether in a later study we can use uh, what outcome measures we can use um, in the Hungarian population. 
from uh, we are looking at the body uh, five index by the, the WHO, and then uh, we discarded a couple of the more mental health stress and anxiety or depression specific measures um, because they looked at clinical populations. And then now um, some of my colleagues in Hungary have developed a, a mental health test, so we will likely be using that uh, later on. Um, and so here I wanted to show you just one more thing about how the interviews are, are uh, being conducted. So, of course, we have some of the questions about what young people see as triggers of stress and anxiety in their lives. Um, and we are scoping what purpose means to them. We try to operationalize it. And then what we do um, is to scope when and how they have experienced adversity in life is that we use um, this counseling timeline. So basically, they draw a line which represents their, uh, their life up to now. And then they mark key milestones in their life. And then they talk about whether that was a positive or negative milestone, but they speak about how that milestone shaped their life up to now. So that's interesting because that helps us not say the word resilience in the, in, in the interview, but rather help them verbalize what and in what way shaped their life, if that makes sense. So this has been an interesting thing. And then so about the crowdsourcing service. So I mentioned that in the rapid review, it has been a challenge that um, most of the literature is not available in English. It's in Hungarian, and um, which is fine, but a lot of that work would be either observational studies or let's say reflective pieces about what should be made available for young people so that they can cope better. Um, or some of the literature talks about in the Central and Eastern European region, either, either about the Ukraine war, or it would talk about, uh, for example, the, the Kosovo war before. So it would be a very informal and informed literature. Um, and a lot of the initiatives that are taking place are not there in the peer reviewed, uh, in peer -reviewed, peer -reviewed literature. So what we are doing is we do a survey, uh, which we call a crowdsourcing survey, and basically on a snowballing basis, that survey goes out to different professionals, so they share about the practices that they use in, in their work. Um, so we can look at whether that's based on an evidence-based intervention that comes from the literature, or whether that has been built, built on their clinical experience. Um, so that's the thinking um, behind. Yeah, and so I have talked about the rapid review. Yeah, so the, the search, Terms have been changing for a long time by now, just so that we can grasp as much as possible um, from, from the peer-reviewed literature. Um, and basically, uh, just to wrap this up, that I have um, by now submitted some funding applications so that we can continue this work beyond this one-year fellowship and that we can actually build on some of these early qualitative mostly qualitative results and, and work on developing a program that supports young adults coping. Um, this is all funding dependent now, so I'm pushing that. Um, and yeah, just to uh, finish at the LSC, what I'm very much enjoying is that they support, um, they support people like me who like to, who like to um, explore their opportunities in, uh, in academia. And so uh, I'm writing a blog, which is called The Traveling Psychologist, and they've been very supportive with that. Um, and with a side project called Mentalica, which is reviewing evidence-based um, mental health applications um, online. So with that, thank you very much. Um, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>